Space studies are teaching us about the strange, shrunken objects that old stars turn into. White dwarfs, neutron stars, and especially black holes. X-ray astronomy has played a very big role in uh, proving the existence of black holes. I think just in the last 10 years, the uh, uh, people who have fought the concept of such a weird object actually existing in the universe have given up. <laughs> I think we all now agree that black holes exist. Uh, we have two classes of them, and uh, both are uh, well studied through uh, X-ray astronomy. Often, when a star is a bright source of X-rays, it turns out to be a double star. Pairs of elderly stars can settle into a sort of mutually antagonistic relationship like an old married couple that have become the best of enemies. The larger star has reached the red giant stage of its career when it slowly shrugs off its outer layers into space. So it perpetually blows smoke, or at least hydrogen, into the face of its partner. The lesser star has already gone through this phase and has shrunk down into a white dwarf or neutron star, or a black hole. It responds to its partner's gas attacks by spitting out a lethal shower of high energy radiation. One of the nearest and brightest of these X-ray binary stars goes by the name of Cygnus X1. Astronomers have learned enough about the system to take some of the black hole's measurements. The black hole is the massive object which is now just about 20 miles in diameter and yet it's got 10 times the mass of the sun. That's such a high density of, of matter that the light can't escape and hence the term black. It's not black to us viewing from a distance because this material that's coming streaming off its companion star gets trapped around the black hole and it works its way into an orbit and then as it comes in towards the black hole it goes orbits faster and faster and faster. We call this an accretion disk and as this gas goes faster and faster it naturally gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It gets to 10 million degrees then even 100 million degrees. Its speed as it gets in close to the black hole approaches the speed of light and at the very last kind of orbit it breaks loose and does a plunge right into the event horizon and disappears from our universe forever. As it disappears, the super hot gas is emitting a blast of X-rays that we can observe from 6,000 light years away. And yet by cosmic standards, Cygnus X1 is considered a harmless garden variety black hole. That's class one. Then we have even bigger black holes. In the center of every major galaxy, it does appear that there is a huge black hole. I like to think of it as the uh, disposal down at the bottom of the sink. Anything that works its way to the, the gravitational center of a galaxy has no way to get out, and eventually it works its way into this black hole. Um, at the center of our Milky Way now, we're pretty sure that there's a black hole with about three million times the mass of the sun. One of the larger galaxies in our part of the universe is known to astronomers as M87. This monster of a star system contains a black hole that may be a thousand times more massive than the one in the heart of the Milky Way. That's as much mass as three billion solar systems, all of it locked up forever in the gravitational prison of a black hole. What we would like to find out is whether or not supermassive black holes exist in all galaxies. We'd like to know whether the galaxies formed around these supermassive black holes, or whether the supermassive black holes formed from the stuff in the galaxies. We don't know what's the chicken and what's the egg. Did the galaxy come first, or do these supermassive black holes come first? And if the black holes came first, where did they come from? The biggest news in X-ray astronomy since the field began is a device called Chandra. This is a big orbiting observatory, the X-ray equivalent of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's named Chandra after the nickname of Subramanian Chandrasekhar. He was a Nobel Prize winning pioneer of astrophysics. Chandrasekhar quite literally wrote the textbooks that taught a whole generation of astronomers 
how stars work. One of the Chandra Observatory's first achievements was to solve a long-standing puzzle. In certain parts of the X-ray band, the whole sky appears to be faintly glowing. This was hard for astronomers to explain. In the early days of high-energy astronomy, the images they got simply weren't clear enough. Well, we saw this diffuse uh, emission that, that anywhere you looked in the sky, there was some X-ray emission coming from that point. And we didn't know if, if there were lots of discrete sources of X-rays or whether there was just this sort of large-scale diffuse hot gas that permeated the universe. We had no idea, but we now know that most of the X-rays come from individual point sources, and many of those point sources are at fairly high redshift. They're probably young galaxies and quasars. Quasars are bright but relatively small sources of radiation. At least they look small to us, but they turn out to be at enormous distances. It seems that there can be a chaotic, violent stage in a galaxy's early years when the black hole at the center goes on a kind of eating binge. Clouds of gas and dust, even the occasional whole solar system, get sucked down the gravitational drain. The accretion disk overflows, and all kinds of astrophysical hell breaks loose. The resulting fireworks can be seen for billions of light years in all directions. After perhaps a few thousand years, the fuel supply runs out, and the quasar turns into a normal, well-behaved galaxy. Or at least that's the picture we're starting to get from Chandra. Astronomers are showing a lot of confidence in Chandra because its X-ray images are so clear. A telescope's ability to record fine detail, what astronomers call resolution, is measured in terms of arc seconds. The full moon, for example, is about 1,800 arc seconds across. Optical telescopes usually can resolve details less than one arc second in size. Chandra makes uh, images that have resolutions of about an arc second, which is very, very good for, for X-ray astronomy. So we're finally on the, the scale where we're getting pictures that are very similar to optical images. There's so much that has come out of the Chandra observations that the theorists are at a loss to explain some of it. There's a big debate right now uh, going on on how to interpret the spectroscopy uh, of these quasars. And what spectroscopy is, is spreading the light out like a rainbow so that we can analyze in detail the relationship between different parts of the rainbow. And what that tells us about the inside of quasars is that there is material near the heart of the quasar that is being expelled from near the black hole. So rather than having all of the stuff falling in towards the black hole, some of it is actually being shot out at velocities that are close to half the speed of light, enormous velocities. And this process is not well understood. We're not sure if the bumps and wiggles that we see in the spectrum are coming from atoms that are emitting light or atoms that are absorbing light. It's very difficult to interpret because we're in uh, realms of high energy physics that we've never been in before. Of course, from the scientific point of view, that's half the fun. X-ray astronomy lets us look at parts of space where the laws of everyday physics